people say, oh, well, the reason there's so much obesity is people are not following the my plate or the pyramid or the ADA or the HDA. And, and they're lazy. <laughs> yeah, it, right, right. It, and that's absolutely false. When the research is done, people have reduced their saturated fat intake. They have stopped drinking whole milk and switched to skim milk or 1% or 2%. They have stopped they're eating way less pork and bacon and, and, and pork belly than they used to. Yet everybody continues to get fatter and more diabetic. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the problem is that instead of each individual healthcare provider like me or dietitian like you, instead of them going, okay, this is, I know what the American Heart Association said. They say eat the DASH diet. But does that make sense? And is it working in my patients? Welcome to the Dr. Ashley Show. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Dr. Ashley Show. I am Dr. Ashley, and today I've got an amazing guest with us. I'm so excited, so grateful for his time. And it's Dr. Ken Berry. Uh, Dr. Ken Berry is a practicing family physician who has been practicing medicine since 2003. He is a passionate advocate of health on his YouTube channel, where he has over 2 million subscribers. Amazing. Along with this online presence, he is active in the keto community and is best known for his direct, no-nonsense approach to health and wellness. Dr. Barry is the author of the best-selling book, Lies My Doctor Told Me. He has also co-authored two more best-selling books, Kicking Ass After 50 and Common Sense Labs. He takes pride in working with the real people of the world in continuing his mission to bring an end to the obesity and type 2 diabetes epidemics along with bringing awareness to such issues as thyroid health and hormone optimization. So thank you, Dr. Barry, again, for being here. I'm so excited. And I know that, yeah, so many of our followers and many of our clients at PhD Weight Loss have asked me to interview you. So I know that they can't wait for all of the wisdom that you have to share. Oh, let's do it. Well, why don't you share with us for those of individuals who aren't sure of where you come from and, and what you do. Will you share a little bit of your backstory as to how you got into all of this and waking us up to the truth about nutrition and medicine in general? Sure. So I'm a classically trained allopathic physician, an MD, trained at a state medical university, not the best in the country, but one of the good ones. And uh, all my life, I've been very slender. I uh, used to try to work out and put on muscle. I used to try to gain weight, couldn't gain weight at all. And that changed rather abruptly at about 32, 33 years of age. Uh, I was working full-time as an emergency room physician and also at a clinic uh, that I was running full-time as well. So I lived in scrubs, mm -hmm. which have a drawstring. And so you don't get immediate feedback when you when you live in scrubs if you put on any weight or not. And so one Sunday morning, I was going to put on my church pants and go to church. And uh, the, the button liked about this much closing. And I'm like, oh, crap. I knew I'd gained a little weight, right? But I did not realize how much I'd gained. And so I got on the scale and I was 297 pounds. And, uh, you know, all through, when I graduated high school, I weighed 180, 185. So that was a lot. And so I thought, well, I need to check some lab work on myself because like most doctors and nurses, I'm a terrible patient and I'd never done any of that. So I checked a full panel. Turns out I was pre-diabetic. My inflammatory markers were high. Uh, and then I also had a whole host of other maladies like severe reflux, heartburn, dandruff, toenail fungus, joint pain, stiffness, arthritis, and an old injury I got playing basketball. And so I thought, well, I, I, I'm a common sense country guy. I can't be that fat doctor that's telling people, hey, you need to lose a little weight. That just doesn't work for me. And so I, I thought, well, I got to fix that. And so I started jogging three times a week. I adopted, since I was pre-diabetic, I adopted the American Diabetes Association guidelines. I started making their recipes, drinking lots of fruit smoothies, eating whole grain bread, no more white bread. And I stopped eating my morning breakfast that was a large glass of Dutch chocolate milk with powdered donuts crumbled up in it. Mm -hmm. That's what I was, that was my <laughs> typical breakfast. And I, and so I stopped that and I started having uh, a, a big fruit smoothie and some whole grain bread with margarine. And I stopped the bacon, stopped all the saturated fat. And I, and I did that for three months and I rechecked everything. And I was actually more pre-diabetic and had gained another two or three pounds. 
And it was, that was my epiphany where I was like, because in, in medical practice, a lot of people won't know this, but doctors judge their patients all the time. Do they? <laughs> we doubt our patients all the time. And so I would give people the literal advice that I was following. I would say, look, you just need to join the gym and join Weight Watchers and stop eating all of the saturated fat and, and eat whole wheat, whole wheat bread, you know, lots of fruits and vegetables. And and then they would come back and they'd gain weight and, and their diabetes had gotten worse. And so I would I would be like, and they're like, I did everything you told me, doc. And I was like, mm-hmm, sure you did. But now I had this new evidence, didn't I, Ashley? I live with me. I knew what I'd been doing the last three months. I had been jogging three days a week and I hated it. I hate to jog, hate it. And I had been eating all the things and stopped eating all the other things and it did not work. It did not help at all. So I'm faced with this thing that all this nutrition advice I've been giving to all my patients was just stupid because it, I did it. It didn't work for me. And if it didn't work for the doctor, how the hell is it supposed to work for a patient? And that was the point where I was like, oh man, I, I've gotten something's wrong here. There's there, the, you know, you get, you find this incongruity and you're like, the world just doesn't add up right now. Yeah. And, and the last thing I wanted to do was give my patients bad advice. Of course, I want to be a great doctor. I want to help my patients and I want them to see success when they follow my advice. I don't want them to just be like, well, that didn't work. Okay. And so then I started reading outside the box. I stopped listening to the American Diabetes Association. I read three books, uh, Atkins Diet Revolution, The Primal Blueprint by Mark Sisson and The Paleo Diet by Lauren Corday. Now, let me be clear, I don't still advocate everything I learned in those books, but that was kind of the eye openers for me, where I was like, oh, so there are, there are people out there advocating other things. Let me look into this more. And so I started following a paleo primal kind of diet, and I noticed I started losing a little weight. And then I kept hearing about this ketogenic diet. That's back when it was 2018, 2017, when it was really starting to become popular. And when I looked into the physiology of it, I'm like, actually, that makes a lot of sense, right? And so I started to adopt the ketogenic thing into my my diet and my lifestyle, immediately started to lose noticeable amounts of weight, fat, aka fat, because that's what we want to lose. We don't want to lose muscle or bone. We want to lose fat. And I was doing that, and my A1C was getting better. Lots of my other medical complaints, dandruff the toenail fungus, the, the joint pain were getting better and they were getting better too quickly for me to blame them on, oh, it's just the weight loss. Because mm-hmm. they were getting better right at, as quickly, if not more quickly, than the weight was coming off. Right. So then I'm, I'm left as a doctor who tries to think about things. I'm left with, no, dude, it wasn't just the weight loss that made your knee pain better. Your knee pain was better before you had lost that much weight. So how do you explain that? So I'm, I, it, 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 it not only helped reverse my severe obesity and reverse my prediabetes back to normal, but it left me with hundreds of other clinical questions. How did, why did your dandruff go away? Why is your rosacea now in complete remission? I've, I've had rosacea since I was in my late 20s, but you can't tell it now. Mm-mm. I'm a redneck, so my skin tends to be red. But as far as the <laughs> rosacea, I used to have to put steroid cream on three days a week or, or it would look like I had overheated. Mm-hmm. But now you can't tell I have that at all. I was starting to get the rhino, rhinophyma, uh, yeah. early stages of that from the rosacea. All that stopped and went away. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had inflamed gums that bled very readily. That went away. That's not from weight loss. You can't say that's from weight loss, mm-hmm. right? So I had all these. And so then I really went down multiple rabbit holes. Why did my gums get healthier? Why did my scalp get healthier? Why did my toenail fungus go away? Why is my knee pain so much better so quickly? And that's when I actually, I went back to medical school and you know, the big uh, physiology textbook, right? That's yeah. I've got a two volume set. That's literally, if you put them together, it's this, mm-hmm. the, like the Oxford, the full Oxford uh, dictionary mm-hmm. of physiology. And I started going back to that book more than I'd ever done as a physician going back to that. Like, how did that, how does that make any sense? And I kept bumping up against insulin metabolism. Mm-hmm. and hyperinsulinemia. And indeed, if you watch a lot of my YouTube videos, you, I talk about that very, very commonly because that seems like that's the root cause for many of the chronic medical conditions. 
that people suffer from that doctors just tell them, dude, that's just a chronic progressive thing. It's your genetics. We don't really know what causes it. Well, it turns out none of that's true. It turns out that if you're eating enough carbohydrates to make yourself hyperinsulinemic, and if you're eating enough inflammatory food to make yourself chronically inappropriately inflamed, all those maladies, all those diseases, they appear like magic. And when you remove those things from your diet, again, it seems like magic, but it's not magic. It's physiology. (laughs) It's yeah. this physiology that most doctors either never learned or they forgot because after about the fourth year of medical training, actually, all nobody talks about phys- physiology. Mm-hmm. All they talk about is pharmacology. Yeah. You've got to know the latest drug for this, that, and the other. You've got to know the top five side effects. You've got to know the starting dose, all that kind of stuff. What if they have renal disease? How do you adjust the dose? That becomes mm-hmm. the most important questions as a, a young doctor in training. Nobody talks about physiology anymore, but I had to go back to the physiology to figure out what was going on with me. But then I was able, I gleaned so much information that I was able to start helping my most diabetic patients reverse their type 2 diabetes. My most severely obese patients, I was helping them reverse that and make it go away effortlessly. And the reason I say effortlessly is because, you know, if you're, if, if somebody's supposed to be losing weight, aka fat. Mm-hmm. they think they need to portion control. They think they need to calorie restrict. They think they need to be kind of hungry all the time, and they need yeah. to use their willpower to fight that. But what I was finding is that when you eat the right foods and avoid the wrong foods, you get to do this magical thing. You get to eat until you're comfortably stuck. Just like every other mammal on planet Earth, You get when you're eating the species-appropriate foods, you get to eat until you're full. And then you're not hungry again for a long damn time. Mm-hmm. And that, that's the secret. That's what makes it easy to do. People say, oh, keto is not sustainable. Carnivore is not sustainable. Well, if you're, if you're doing it right, aka eating actually species-specific foods, it's about the easiest diet in the world to follow because you do the following things. When you're hungry, you eat. And you keep eating until you're full. And then you stop eating. And then you don't eat again until you're truly hungry just like every other mammal on the planet. And so in that respect, it's the easiest diet I've ever followed. Uh, and, and I think hundreds of thousands of other people are discovering that as well. And so that's kind of my backstory, how I got there. I was a fat pre-diabetic doctor who, it, that bothered me. Like, you know, I, I would never take my car to a mechanic whose car wouldn't start. That's right. I would I would never get a, a haircut from a, from a cosmetologist whose hair looked awful. Mm-hmm. That's common sense, right? And so why would I why would I take or give nutrition advice from a fat doctor? Because they obviously don't know what they're talking either A, they don't know what they're talking about. And that's that's bad. Or yeah. they don't care about their own health, which I would opine is also bad. Mm-hmm. And so I don't really want to take nutrition advice from a, a fat doctor or a, t- a doctor with type two diabetes. Because yeah. they either don't know or they don't care, both of which could be dangerous to the patient. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I love your story. You know, I was a professional ballet dancer and I struggled with my weight and inflammation. I was pre-diabetic, had high cholesterol in my mid-20s dancing all the time. So exercise wasn't the issue. And I actually had to stop dancing because my body just couldn't handle it anymore. I was counting calories, restricting calories and still not the lean, real lean weight I needed to be to be a ballerina. So I actually went on and earned my PhD in sports nutrition and chronic disease and studied energy metabolism and how do we actually drop weight without having to chronically under eat and starve ourselves all the time. I knew there had to be a way. And I finished up that, the PhD, and I went on to earn my, become a registered dietitian because I thought I'd be this true expert in the field of weight management. And I I know my professors hated me because they talk about type 2 diabetes management and how you need to eat 45 to 60 grams of carbohydrate in each meal and snack. And I would ask why. It doesn't make sense. Diabetes seems like a carbohydrate intolerance situation. So why would we keep feeding the body more? And I just kept questioning. And the first book I read was The Primal Blueprint. And I just read your book again, which is amazing. And all of you guys watching this or listening to this should read The Lies My Doctor Told Me. It is an amazing book. I loved it. And you mentioned The Primal Blueprint. And I think that is a a great layperson way of thinking about how we just need to live as a human species. 
Yes. Um, and it's a beautiful thing getting back into that state because like you said, we actually can trust the way we feel. We can trust when we're hungry. We can trust when we're full. Our body's actually giving us the right signals when we get our hormones where they need to be. So um, yeah, it's amazing. I love that. Yeah, and, and the, the main hormone that causes all the problems seems to be insulin. Yeah. Because, and so, for, for example, PCOS. Women with PCOS mm -hmm. are very often told, oh, your testosterone is too high, your DHEA is too high, and that's what's causing your PCOS. Right. This is absolutely false. And in the show notes of my YouTube video about PCOS, I actually have the, the links to the literature, to the research, showing that those are not the root cause. Mm -hmm. they, that does happen in, in PCOS, but that's not the root cause. The root cause is hyperinsulinemia, which leads to all of the other hormone defects. Mm -hmm. And so that's why PCOS is almost uniformly reversible with some degree of low carbohydrate diet. And for many women, keto with 20 total grams a day, that, that fixes it. Mm -hmm. Some women have to go ketovore, which is 10 total grams or less a day. Wow. And some women need carnivore, which is uh, essentially zero carb, not not actually, but essentially. That's what they have to do to get their hyperinsulinemia low, back to low, normal and up, mm -hmm. so that their other hormones can re-equilibrate and go back to the normal range. And then all the symptoms of PCOS go away. And I'll tell you, actually, one of the first ways that I, when I started recommending a ketogenic diet to my most severely obese patients. Mm -hmm. I had two women that had been trying, well, one had been trying for years to get pregnant. Yeah. The other was absolutely done, did not want to get pregnant. One was 48 uh -oh. years old, one was 51 <laughs> years old. And after a few months on a ketogenic diet, they both lost lots of weight. They'd come back for their six month checkup. This didn't happen on the same day, but roughly the same time, the 48 year old was pregnant. And was over the moon yeah. because she didn't think she was ever going to be able to get pregnant. The 51-year-old lady came in and she was not over the moon. <laughs> was not happy at all that she was pregnant. And she, oh. later, she later came to, yeah. to grips with it and was wound up. It was great. And, and they, she was happy. Uh -huh. They both had beautiful babies. But it, that was another question, Ashley. I was like, these, how do these women get, I mean, 51? Mm -hmm. How do these women get pregnant? And it, back when I was recommending it just for weight loss, I was kill, still kind of uh, skittish of a, of, a, of a what I could now call a proper human diet, but then it was ketogenic. I was using it just as a weight loss hack. I did not realize the physiological power it had yeah. to reverse and correct so many things, including PCOS and including increasing the rate of fertility in women who are having trouble conceiving and indeed multiple fertility specialists now are using either a ketogenic diet or a carnivore diet that's mandatory to be in their fertility program mm -hmm. that they 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 require that you eat either a ketogenic diet or a carnivore diet because they've seen it enough times to know that it's, it increases your risk of getting knocked up and so if any woman out there is like yeah I want to lose some weight but I do not want to get pregnant Make sure and, and make sure you've got your birth control in place because a ketogenic diet, a real whole food ketogenic diet, or a carnivore diet, they will increase your risk of becoming pregnant. Yes, we see fertility clinics send patients our way because that's what happens. It just increases the likelihood so significantly. And like you said, it's not because of the weight loss, it's because of the metabolic changes in folks health. So for these ladies who have PCOS and they drop their carbs down significantly, does that in a sense heal the body and they can start to be a little bit less restrictive and kind of go up some tiers there or do they have to maintain that? Yeah. And, well, and so that's a great question. So first of all, a, a moment ago, you, you called type two diabetes carbohydrate intolerance. Yeah. And I think that's a great paradigm of thinking about this, but I'd like to go a step further. And that's when, when I came up with the principles of a proper human diet. One of mm -hmm. the principles is, is that human beings, homo sapiens sapiens, are by definition a low-carbohydrate mammal. There is no healthy, high-carbohydrate diet for human beings. That's my hypothesis mm -hmm. uh, with the proper human diet principles. We are by design a low-carbohydrate mammal. And so it's not that certain people have a carbohydrate 
intolerance. It's that type 2 diabetes is carbohydrate toxicity syndrome. Okay. You're just eating too many carbohydrates for your species and for your specific DNA. Now, it's absolutely true. Some humans can tolerate more carbohydrates than others. Absolutely. But that doesn't mean that carbohydrates are good for any human. It just means some of us can tolerate more of it than others. And so when you look at it like that, you're like, oh, okay. So that kind of changes the entire way you think about diet in general. None of us are designed for a high carbohydrate diet. and But some of us suffer more from a high carbohydrate diet than others. Just like some animals can tolerate more of a specific poison than other animals animals. That doesn't mean that that poison's good for that specific animal. It just means they're able to tolerate it more, seemingly. And so for women with PCOS, the hyperinsulinemia keeps everything mucked up. And then also diets that cause hyperinsulinemia almost always cause chronic inappropriate inflammation. And when you mix those two things, chronic inappropriate inflammation with hyperinsulinemia, one of the ways that can manifest in human beings is polycystic ovarian syndrome, which I'm sure you know, Ashley, it really has nothing to do with the cysts in your ovaries. It has Mm -hmm. everything to do with the the hormone imbalances that occur in the female human body. And that leads to infertility. That leads to inappropriate hair growth, inappropriate hair loss, inappropriate weight gain, inappropriate hormone levels from multiple different systems, which can lead to a whole host of symptoms. Mm -hmm. And even in that subgroup, some women with PCOS are not overweight but they're absolutely infertile because of the hormone abnormalities. And so what I think is happening is when you lower the carbohydrate intake and lower the inflammatory food intake, what you're effectively doing is you're giving that woman's body a chance to heal. And I've come to believe that the default state for everybody's body is good health, is vibrant health. That's the default setting for the human body. Only to the degree that you poison it with the slow poisons that are mm-hmm. that are the standard Western diet, do you experience some degree of disease or uh, dis-ease, right? And that to the degree which you stray from a proper human diet, that's the degree to which you suffer. Some people suffer more than other people because of the normal distribution curve in human physiology. Some people can just tolerate more of the slow poison. That is the high carbohydrate, highly inflammatory standard Western diet. Some people cannot tolerate that whatsoever. We actually see that. uh, And I was going to tell you earlier, all of this studying of human physiology has caused me to branch out into archaeology, anthropology, paleoanthropology. And so now I start looking at groups of humans and, and what diet they ate in the past. Mm-hmm. And and then you start to see. So, for example, like I said earlier, some people just cannot tolerate the carbohydrates. When you look at, at, at American uh, Native American populations. Yes. Right? When you look at many African American populations. When you look at Polynesian populations. The, the amount of carbohydrates that would just make a, a white boy like me just get fat. Right? And I got, I got pre-diabetic, but I wasn't type two. I never uh-huh. reached that far. But for some subsets of uh, with different genetics, they become severely type two diabetic on that amount of carbohydrates, right? And so the, the average Native American eating the standard American diet is 100% yeah. of the time type two diabetic. 100% of the time their, their dental health is atrocious. Mm-hmm. They have hypertension. They, have, they start to, and then in the African American population, we start seeing kidney failure. We start seeing amputations, we start seeing blindness much sooner than in Caucasian populations, and that's the difference in the DNA. Some people can tolerate more carbs. Doesn't mean it's good for them. They can just tolerate it seemingly more without having severe, disastrous complications from the chronic diseases caused by too many carbohydrates. So when we, uh, when I, you know, folks say, talk about lower carbohydrate diets, and they say, well, the Japanese eat more rice and eat more carbs and they're healthy or Italians eat pasta and they're healthy. Do you just say that is part of the DNA or what do you say to that? It is some degree their DNA. They're able to tolerate more carbs. But what we, when you start to really look into the anthropology of that Mm -hmm. question, and that is an anthropological question, 
what you find is is that much of the research done on these populations in in Japan and Italy, Okinawa, Sardinia, was done during a time when there was widespread famine and food shortage. Oh. So yes, they were living on a diet of rice. Yes, but almost invariably they were there was some kind of pork in the diet. There was some kind of meat. They were not eating vegan diets that made made them slender. Although a uh, raw vegan vegan diet will make you. Uh, unhealthily skinny. Absolutely, it will. It's not, it's not a healthy skinny. You don't want that. Mm-hmm. But the, these populations had food shortages, right? And so they were basically eating what I now call a starvation diet. Oh, They were eating all the grains. They were eating the beans, of course, because that's invariably better than just starving to death. Mm-hmm. If you and your children are starving, you're going to eat the rice and the bean because you don't want your baby to starve to death. You don't want to starve to death. And those diets will keep you from starving to death, but you will wind up with a long list of vitamin and mineral deficiencies. You will wind up being very slender, but in many cases, if you actually check the full lab panel on these folks, you would see that they're pre-diabetic and they're also very hyperinsulinemic, even though they're very, very slender. And just by outward appearance, they, they look very healthy, like, oh, they're very slender in Japan, in Okinawa. You know, they're very, very skinny in Sardinia. But if you check a fasting insulin level or a C-peptide, you quickly discover they're hyperinsulinemic because they're having to eat all of the carbohydrates in their starvation diet. And now that the food shortage no longer exists, we're starting to see the same degree of obesity in these other countries that we've been seeing in the United States where food shortage has not been a problem since the 1920s and 1930s. So pre-rice, pre-pasta, these folks were eating a lower carbohydrate diet as well. Oh, well, that's exactly right. And so in my study of anthropology and paleoanthropology, it doesn't matter what ethnicity you're talking about, Ashley. Mm-hmm. When you go back in time more than twelve to 15,000 years ago, everybody's relatives w- were eating a ketogenic diet, a, a super carnivore diet, which means at least 70% of their daily food intake was coming from animal products. Mm-hmm. There is no exception to that. And so even if you talk about, you know, the Brahmins in India, or you talk about the, yeah. the, the Buddhists in, in Asian countries, all their ancestors, if you go back further than 12,000 years ago, their diet was predominantly meat-based. Absolutely. Without exception, in, in your question should be, how do we know that? How do we know that's true? You're just making this up. No, we can check a test called isotope analysis, stable isotope analysis, and we can check um, for carbon, nitrogen, strontium, and other isotopes in the fossils, which the, aka the bones of these people, in their teeth, in their bones, if we still have access to cartilage or connective tissue in that, we can tell exactly <clears throat> how much of their diet came from seafood, how much came from red meat, how much came from uh, C3 plants versus C4 plants. We can tell all this information about people that lived 10,000, 20,000, 50,000, even 100,000 years ago. It's obvious in the anthropological circles that before 12,000 years ago, all humans were, were super carnivores, meaning that really? the majority of their food was animal products. Mm-hmm. And this, this, is, this is everybody's ancestor. Okay. There is no exception to that that has ever been found. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I love that. So then why do you think that we are having the vegan diet pushed on us so strongly? What's going on? Vegan, vegetarian. I think there's multiple things going on. First of all, everybody's confused about what a proper human diet is, right? Everybody, even doctors and dietitians, they literally have no clue and worse than that, they don't even know that they don't know. That's right. The average doctor or dietitian thinks, well, if I recommend the food, my plate, right, the food pyramid, I can't go wrong with that, right? I mean, surely to goodness, that that was researched. Uh, if I recommend the American Heart Association's DASH diet, I can't go wrong as a dietitian or a doctor. That's surely got to be good, right? Or the American Diabetes Association. And so the vast majority of healthcare providers and dietitians and nutritionists, they pick one of those strategies and they recommend it, right? And so then when the people come back and say, hey, I, that's not helping at all. My diabetes is worse. I've gained five more pounds. The doctor and dietitian immediately knee-jerk default to you're laying on the couch eating Cheetos and Ding Dogs. You're that's not right. 
doing what I told you to do. And they feel vindicated because they're recommending the recommended diet. It's recommended by the preeminent experts in the world. Mm -hmm. So how in the hell could that be wrong? But it is wrong. And that's, I think, you know, the, the, the people say, oh, well, the reason there's so much obesity is people are not following the my plate or the pyramid or the ADA or the HDA. And they're it, lazy. <laughs> yeah, it, right, right. It, and that's absolutely false. When the research is done, people have reduced their saturated fat intake. They have stopped drinking whole milk and switched to skim milk or 1% or 2%. They have stopped. They're eating way less pork and bacon and, and, and pork belly than they used to. They're all, the, the butchers uniformly trim all the fat off the pork chop or off the ribeye or off the T-bone. There's not nearly as much fat, saturated animal fat in the, in the diet as there used to be, yet everybody continues to get fatter and more diabetic. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the problem is that instead of each individual healthcare provider like me or dietitian like you, Instead of them going, okay, this is, I know what the American Heart Association said. They say eat the DASH diet. But does that make sense? And is it working in my patients? Because that was one of the huge differences, Ashley, when, between when I was just say, look, join Weight Watchers and join the gym. That's what you need to do. Mm -hmm. I got maybe a 2% success rate, right? But when I stopped that and said, look, I want you to focus all your energy all your resources, all your money, all your willpower, all your staying power, right? All of it, all your energy. I want you to focus on eating high fat, adequate protein, very, very, very low carbohydrate foods. I started getting a 70, 80% success rate. Now, there were people that would come back and be like, look, doc, I got to have my biscuits and gravy. I'm a country boy. I'm sorry. I'm yeah. not going to do keto. That's fine. You're a grown adult. You get to make your own decision. But when the people did follow my recommendations, I was getting 70, 80 percent success rate. And that's that's like that's not even in this. I, that's like a logarithmic increase to the <laughs> success rate I was getting when I was literally handing out the American Diabetes Association PDF that any healthcare provider can print off from the ADA website. I just printed that off and say, here, read this. Join Weight Watchers. Join the gym. I got a 1%, 2% success rate from that. But when I, I, I made up a little 15-page uh, handout, I used to call it the ketogenic guidebook. Now it's the proper human diet and handed them that. That was it. I didn't spend an hour with them. I didn't do any of that. I just said, everything you've been taught about nutrition is wrong. Read this and do it and you'll lose weight. And, they're, and you, your A1C will come down. They just go do that because they trusted me. And my God, it worked. Mm -hmm. And they were over the moon that it worked, right? And they're like, hey, because I used to recommend it for three months back before I knew better. Like, don't do this for too long. I don't yes. know. Keep it be dangerous. Uh -huh. But do it. You get your weight under control and get that A1C down. Then you will try something else. Mm -hmm. And they would come back and say, look, doc, I've tried every diet out there. Can I just do this for another three months, please? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And I was like, I think so. I'm reading about it deeply and widely. I can't find any danger, but so yeah, let's do it for another three months, but then come back because I don't know if it's safe long term. Mm -hmm. But now, after years of doing this, knowing what I know from the other genres, not just human nutrition, yes, you can absolutely do this for the rest of your life. Well, what about my kids? Can they eat keto or carnivore? Initially, I was like, yeah, I don't know. Talk to your pediatrician. Now I'm like 100%. Mm -hmm. And indeed, both of our children, uh, Beckett's now four years old. Bonnie Blue's just turned one year old. Oh, the wow. Bite of food, the first bite of food that went in both of their mouth after I'd eaten a beef rib. Uh-huh. I, I would give them the rib when they had a couple of teeth, when they could grab stuff and put it in their mouth. I knew they were ready, right? Baby mm -hmm. led wing principles. I knew yeah. they were ready for solid food. I would just hand them the rib bone. And yeah. they would literally, with their two little teeth, they would clean that rib bone so clean that when they dropped it in the floor, our little pee, uh, Yorkie poo didn't even want anything. To do. Okay. <laughs> we did the so same with our of, kids. Uh, yeah. yeah, no BB so cereal, not. you know? <laughs> Absolutely. And so what about my teenage daughter? What about my fill in the blank? And so I eventually had to start saying, if 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 whoever you're about to ask me about is a human being uh -huh. and they can fog a mirror, meaning they're not dead, then a ketogenic, ketovore, or carnivore diet is the proper human diet for them. There is no exception to that. 
Mm-hmm. And that makes it a lot easier for most people. It makes it a proper human diet. That doesn't sound dangerous, but ketogenic, you're like, yeah, I don't know. It sounds sciencey and faddish. Maybe yeah. it's not safe. No, this is a proper human diet. This is the way our ancestors ate for 99% of their existence on this planet. This is not a new diet. Mm. This is not a fad diet. Our ancestors ate as much fatty meat as they could get their hands on, without exception. Every time they found a nest of eggs, they ate every egg in the nest, probably including the shell as well. Right. And then they ate chicken that laid the egg. <laughs> and then they moved on. That's a proper human diet. Now, when they're hungry and they can't find meat and eggs, did they eat plants? Of course they did, 100%. If they were starving, they would eat any plant they could put in their mouth that, mm-hmm. that was not known to be poisonous. Yes, that's called a starvation diet. And so indeed, in archaeology and anthropology, when we look at empires, what did the emperors feed the slaves? What did they feed uh, the, the prisoners of war? Grains and beans, 100%, because that's a starvation diet. It's really cheap. It, it, they're not going to rebel on that diet because their testosterone is going to be low. They're going to be inflamed. They're going to have mental fog, but they're going to be awake and aware enough that they can do their slave labor mm-hmm. with you right behind them with the whip, right? Mm-hmm. And then it's the cheapest diet you can feed a human to keep them from starving to death. And so absolutely, every that's a slave prisoner diet. That's what, that's what the grain-based, plant-based diet is. Mm-hmm. And so it's it's odd, isn't it, that it's become so popular and it's now dressed up as the healthiest diet a human can eat is a grain-based diet with lots of plants. But that's literally the diet that the emperors fed to the slaves. And so you remember the, the movie The Game Changer, right? You remember mm-hmm. that? It, they were bragging about the Roman gladiators. Yeah. Lived on rice and beans, right? And, mm-hmm. and so... The average American who's seen the movie Gladiator with Russell Crowe, mm-hmm. they think, oh, gladiators were superstars, super athletes. Mm-hmm. No, gladiators were either slaves or prisoners of war. That was 100% of who a gladiator was. And so they fed them the cheapest diet that they could feed them that would keep them from starving to death. That's why gladiators lived on rice and beans, not because that was some kind of super diet for athletes. That was a slave diet, and that's what you feed slaves. So you don't spend a lot of money. You're not going to give the slaves ribeye and egg yolk. That's going to be for the ruling class because that's the bit, the healthiest diet. You're going to give them the cheapest diet you can give them that keeps them from starving to death. And so I think that the plant-based people, they're very wise. They're very market savvy. They're marketing to children. They're marketing to teenagers who haven't formed their paradigms yet. They're still just trying to figure out the world. And so they see these these sexy and handsome YouTube influencers and Instagram influencers making up their green smoothie and saying plant-based is the way. And so they're like, okay, I really respect this 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 man or woman, so I'm just going to do plant-based. That's what I'm going to do. Also, mm-hmm. it's safe the planet, Ashley. I know. So you've got this, right? You've got these beautiful people on Instagram saying plant-based is the healthiest diet, and also it saves our Mother Earth. Mm-hmm. Well, if you're if you're a young person, why where's the problem there? They don't tell you about the twelve supplements that you've got to take every day, or you will develop vitamin and mineral ne- ne- deficiencies. Mm-hmm. They don't tell you that part. They just show them drinking their green drink and wearing their bikini, or you know taking their shirt off. And yeah, for many people on a standard Western diet, if, if they convert to a plant based diet, they're gonna feel better for a while because you remove a lot of the inflammatory crap. Right. But it's not going to be long term. It's not sustainable because you're going to have to wind up eating for 12 solid hours a day to be able to get enough nutrition. You're going to have to take anywhere from nine to 12 different supplements to get all of the vitamins and minerals your body needs. If you're a poor converter of ALA, which is the omega-3 fatty acid found in in, in mm-hmm. plant, if, if you some people's body have has a hard time converting that to DHA and EPA. Yep. You're not going to get enough of that. So you're going to have brain fog. You're going to have nerve issues. You're going to have all kinds of problems. If you're one of the people that cannot convert beta carotenoids into true vitamin A, yeah, you're going to suffer on a plant-based diet. And so how many people listening to this right now, raise your hand. Nobody can see you. Raise your hand if you believe there's vitamin A in a carrot. Raise your hand. Do you believe that? 
Because if you do, you're one of the people who's been misled. Mm -hmm. There is zero vitamin A in a carrot. There is no vitamin A in any plant food on planet Earth. Not in spinach, not in kale, not in blueberries, not in not in carrots. No vitamin A. If you're sitting there right now going, this guy's nuts. <laughs> I looked it up. I there's a, I, 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 it's on my Pinterest. High vitamin A foods. Carrots is number one. No, no. Carrots and other vegetables are rich in beta carotenoid, which some people are efficient converters. They can convert it into actual retinol vitamin A, which is real vitamin A for human beings. But about 88% of people are poor converters. So I'm they have- Poor converter. Are you? Yeah. You we have, had our whole family tested and we were all low. Absolutely. Absolutely. Five. And so if you're eating a plant-based diet, there's an 88% chance that you are severely deficient in real vitamin A. Yep. And that's a huge problem. And so that's why what, what we're seeing now in the carnivore community, I've been to carnivore full disclosure for five years, five and a half years now. Because I have to be as close to zero carb as possible or I'll start to gain weight in the belly and my A1C will start to creep up. I have to yeah. be just as low carb as possible for my DNA, for my gut microbiome, for how, or for whatever reason, that's my spectrum of the proper human diet is as close to zero carb as possible. But there are people on a plant-based diet who are severely deficient in iodine, in true omega-3s, DHA and EPA, mm -hmm. which is what the human brain and body needs. And in retinol vitamin A, which is real vitamin A, but they truly believe in their heart of hearts that a that a carrot and some kale that's a rich source of vitamin A. It's a lie. But if you tell somebody a lie early enough in their life, when they're still impressionable, they'll believe that. And not only will they just believe it, it'll become part of their belief system. That's right. A much deeper thing than just oh, I think that's true. No, they believe that with their heart of hearts, and that's why. The diet wars, the nutrition wars become so heated and so emotional is people don't just believe that there's vitamin A in a carrot. They believe mm -hmm. that there's vitamin A in a carrot. And if you talk bad about carrots or bananas on social mm -hmm. media, they will attempt to crucify you because you are talking about it's almost a religious belief. Yeah. And so it's very hard for them to, to step back and go, wait, do I believe something that's just not true? Let me look this up. And so, yeah, there's so many things like that out there in the plant-based community that, that even the influencer, they believe it. They're not lying. Mm -hmm. They believe it, but they're just wrong. And this so new, that's why. I, go ahead. This new Blue Zone documentary talks about them all eating vegan as well. Or maybe they didn't, but you still should. <laughs> right. And so Dan Buechner, I read his book. God, it's it was back in, I don't know, 2012? Forever ago, way before I gave any hoots about human nutrition at all. I just thought it was an interesting concept. I was very into life extension and longevity back then. Yeah. But I didn't know about nutrition. So I was like, oh, you can live longer eating this certain way. Let me read this book. Mm -hmm. And when I read the book, I was on fire for it. I thought this is the coolest thing ever. Mm -hmm. I'd never stopped to question. I wonder if he, you know, if he had a preconceived notion, if he had a preconceived belief, if there was any foolishness in the data, I just bought it hook, line, and sinker. Mm -hmm. But now when I go back and look at it, I realize that in places like Sardinia and in Gu Guanacaste, which is the state where the little town is, where yeah. they live longer in Costa Rica, mm -hmm. there were no birth certificates. And when, when modern society kind of came to Sardinia and came to Costa Rica and they said, hey, if you're 65 years of age or older, you qualify for Social Security benefits. You can get a check every month. Well, guess what, Ashley? If I don't, if I didn't have a birth certificate and I was 48, 55, 52, all of a sudden, guess how old I was? I'm a poor person. I'm 65. Yes, I'm 65. I don't have a birth certificate. And so huge amounts of fraud. And I don't, I don't blame the people in Sardinia mm -hmm. and in Guanacaste. I don't blame them. If I could get a free check every month just by budging my age a little bit, absolutely, I would do that. And so... There's actually a study that's recently been published that showed that when they instituted, you've got to have a birth certificate to qualify for, mm -hmm. for retirement benefits, the rate of centenarians plummeted from like 10% to 0.2%. No and way. so when they had to prove that they were 65, all of a sudden, all these centenarians, all these people living so long, 105, 110, 115, they disappeared. 
because it, when you when you have to prove how old you are, when mm-hmm. you have to show a birth certificate, it, that magical ability of the blue zones to make people live to be 110, it, it disappears somehow when you have to have a birth certificate to prove your age. And then also he, he greatly overestimated the percentage of plants versus the percentage of animal foods. Every single one of the blue zones that he talks about, except for Loma Linda. They ate lots of pork, and it was pork. It wasn't even it wasn't even grass fed, grass finished beef, or skinless, you know, boneless chicken breast. Mm-hmm. It was pork. They were every every dish they make had pork or bacon grease or or bacon or pig fat in it. Every single one of them, without exception. Another thing that's really weird about the blue zones is they were uniformly places where poor people live. Right. And anybody that studies demographics. And epidemiology know that the the poorer population is the shorter their life expect that so the expectancy so it was weird right off the bat that these yeah. people were living so long also the rates of smoking in Sardinia and, and in Guanacaste sky high and so Butner would have us believe that these poor people who have a high percentage of smoking they're living to be 110 years of age. It's just so, and, and so for people who just read the book, yeah, it's compelling. I totally mm-hmm. agree. I bought it. Mm-hmm. But then when you start to look into it, it quickly falls apart. But I think it's funny that now it's becoming very popular again. He's got a, 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 a I don't know, eight part miniseries on yep. Netflix or somewhere. And so this new generation of people who want to live long and be healthy and be slender, blue zone, that's where it's at. And it's been completely and utterly refuted. And the, the argument has been torn to shreds. But if you're a if you're a, a, a teenager or a twenty something and you don't study nutrition for a living, you don't find nutrition science sexy like I do mm-hmm. and like you do. Mm-hmm. You just see this documentary, and you're like, oh my god, I'm gonna eat beans and rice, and when I get tired of that, I'm gonna eat rice and beans because that's how you <laughs> eat, you know twenty, and it's complete both. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. I didn't know that about the birth certificates. Yeah, yeah, and there's a new study that, and you can see the curve, like all oh, these centenarians, and then when they instituted dog, you gotta have a birth certificate to qualify for SSI. The centenarians, the rate of it just plummets, like literally straight down. Like, oh gosh, they all disappeared immediately. Wow, they that requirement. Interesting, awesome. Well, I have a, I have a question on weight loss specific. Sure. What do you think about semaglutide? terzepatide, all of these drugs from a weight loss yeah. perspective. The GLP-1 and, uh, receptor inhibitor yeah. work like magic. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. But it's not magic. It's physiology. And so the GLP-1 receptor, we know that it's in the brain and in the gut. And so we think that that's how the, the GLP-1 receptors actually work. But the problem is, is there are also GLP-1 receptors in the kidney. There's a lot. There's a lot of them in cardiac tissue. There's a lot of them in lots of different tissues. They're not just in the brain and the gut. And so I predict that this is going to end very, very bad because the payday that the big pharmaceutical houses are getting from the GLP-1 inhibitors like Ozempic and Wegovy and the others, oh. it's it's billions, Ashley. And how yeah. are you going to say no to billions, right? Every single study that showed Ozempic to be safe or Wegovy or any of the rest of them was designed and performed by the drug company and the many of the researchers were they either owned stock in the company that made the drug or they were actual employees of the company that designed the study and also made the drug and so i predict that this is going to end very badly and i caution people please please do your due diligence do your research before you start uh ozempic or we go or any of the other gop ones you got to do your research, but and there's actually a black box, box warning about C cell thyroid cancer on there already. Yeah, I saw I that. Predict there's, I, I predict there's going to be multiple other black box warnings added as more research comes in. And people say, no, 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 there's no way that would be FDA approved if there weren't long term studies showing it to be safe. That's a common belief in out, out in society. Mm-hmm. And when I tell them, no, honey, you're the long term study. <laughs> yeah, that's They're right. like, wait, what do you mean? I'm like, there are no long-term term studies showing Ozempic to be safe for long-term use. And the only way it's going to help you lose weight and keep that weight off for the rest of your life is if you take it for the rest of your life. That's right. And there is no 10-year data on Ozempic. There's no 20-year data. There's no 30-year data. 
And they're like, well, how was, did he get FDA approved? And I'm like, yeah, good question. You should look into that. Mm -hmm. And, but when, when people who are taking Ozempic out in the wild, mm -hmm. that's society, when they discover, oh, I'm the guinea pig, they're going to, they're going to get the 20 year data and the 30 year safety data. They're going to get that from me. Very often they're like, I did not know that. And that mm -hmm. makes me very uncomfortable. Do you have to wean down Ozempic to stop it? Or can you just stop it cold? Time? <laughs> That's the next most common question I get because there is no long-term safety data. There's mm -hmm. none. We're going to collect that data from the millions of people who are taking a chance with Ozempic or Wegovy, and there's going to be a host of new ones coming, new names, because there's hundreds of billions of dollars to yeah. be made in this. And so if you don't think the big pharmaceutical companies will cut corners, will tweak the data, then you are naive, mm -hmm. okay? Trust me. I've been a doctor for over 20 years. I remember when the Vioxx rep came to my clinic and said, dude, this is the for arthritis. There's nothing better. People will stop taking ibuprofen. They'll stop taking aspirin. They're, they're just going to want Vioxx. I had a, a sample closet full of Vioxx. I believed in Vioxx. When they took it off the market, I was still giving the, my Vioxx samples to people because I did not believe that it was it could be bad. I was good friends with the Vioxx rep. This shows you just how ignorant doctors are. Yeah. I was ignorant. I believed the drug rep who literally had a bachelor's degree in marketing, who didn't know shit about human physiology or nutrition mm -hmm. or, or the, the, the pathways of inflammation. I just blindly believed that drug rep, and I put my patients at risk. So did thousands of other doctors. Mm -hmm. And so I, I hoarded the Vioxx samples. Even when it was taken off the market, I would still give it to select patients because I knew I knew they wouldn't tell me because I still believe it was fine. There's no way they'd have put that drug out if, if it was dangerous. I remember that, and I remember having to look in the mirror and go, you're a, you're a moron, dude. Yeah, you're an idiot. You bought it hook, line, and sinker. And so all you guys, listen, you got to take everything that they say with a grain of salt because they're in business to make money. They don't, they will, if, if they do a research study with their drug and it doesn't show the results they want to want to show, they'll do, they'll put it in a file drawer. It's actually called the file drawer problem with research. They, they own the data. They own the, the results of that study and they have no obligation to print the results. They have no obligation to share the raw data. That's they, can, they can file drawer every bit of that, and the general public will never know about the 12 studies that showed it was dangerous. You'll only hear about the, the five studies that shows that it was safe and effective. Mm -hmm. That's how the game's played, and you guys are the guinea pigs, and I want you to know that going into this. Yeah, I think people are just so desperate, but they haven't, they've followed, you know, reduce calories, move more, they're hungry, they're starving, they've failed, quote unquote, failed so many attempts. And, you know, I think what we're sharing is so important because people can go about it following the proper human diet and not have cravings naturally, not be hungry. And it feels so much better than having to take a drug that makes you nauseous and, you know, ha have major GI upset and along with other things. Yeah, so. potentially disastrous side effects in the long term. Who knows? But you're exactly right. It's because people have been given so much crappy yeah. nutrition information by idiot doctors like I used to be. Join Weight Watchers. Here's the ADA handout. That's that's going to work for maybe 1% of the population who has enough willpower to just basically semi-starve themselves for the rest of their life. Right. The 99% of us, including me, probably including you, yep. I don't have that much willpower. If, if I've got to be hungry the rest of my life, I ain't going to do that. No. At some point, I'm going to say, screw this. I'm going to eat as much as I want because that's how mammals are programmed. Mm -hmm. We're programmed to eat until we're full. That's, right. that's, that is not. So let me say this. That's not sinful behavior. That's not behavior you should be ashamed of. That is not behavior that you should beat yourself up about and use that tone of voice with yourself that you know you use every day. That's a good thing. If you're eating a proper human diet, you should eat until you're full. You right. should not push away from the table while you're still hungry. That is not normal behavior. If the average mammal running around in the forest or the jungle or the woods, if you could teach them English and say, look, I, I push away from the table when I'm only 80% full, 
the deer and the coyote and the wolf would look at you like, why do you do that, moron? That's <laughs> dumb. Why are you doing that? You should eat till you're full. Mm -hmm. so that's the way a mammal eats, and we are mammals, believe it or not. And so mm -hmm. we should eat until we're full. That is not sinful. You should not, you should not beat yourself up over that behavior. If you're eating a proper human diet, not only do you get to do that daily, you should do that daily for optimal hit. Mm -hmm. I love that. I have so many more questions for you. I'm going to ask one more and then I'll let you go. So sometimes, you know, for the majority of clients, when they come to us and, and they follow this way of eating and they drop the weight, their cholesterol levels improve. For a small subsection, they go to their doctor, their cholesterol goes up, and they come back and they're saying, my doctor says I shouldn't continue to eat this way, but it feels a little bit contradictory, and I'm confused because I've reversed type 2 diabetes. I no longer have sleep apnea. I no longer have high blood pressure. I've dropped all the medications, but the doctor says, congratulations, however, you cannot do this anymore. Yep. What is or that? You've got to take a step. Or, yeah. So, so talk about that. Help yep. these people. So... If you took 100 people and put them on a very low-carbohydrate ketogenic diet, less than 20 total grams of carbs a day, don't count net carbs, count total carbs. Okay. That way you're not tricked by the manufacturers that, that are putting the keto on the label of everything. Right. There will be keto toilet paper before launch. <laughs> okay? That's coming because keto is so popular. Uh -huh. But if you took 100 people and put them on a true whole food ketogenic diet, less than 20 total grams of carbs a day. One third of those people, their LDL cholesterol would go down. Right. One third of those people, their LDL cholesterol would stay the same. Mm -hmm. And in one third of those people, their LDL cholesterol would go up. And in about one or two percent of those people, their LDL cholesterol would go way up. These are the lean mass hyper responders that Dave Feldman and Nick Norwitz and Siobhan Huggins and other people are studying right now. They're actually, there's a study ongoing right now. Mm -hmm. And so, first of all, let me say that your LDL cholesterol is not a marker of metabolic health. Okay, your doctor might think it is, but it is not. All of the research that proved that high total cholesterol or high LDL cholesterol was bad for you, that was going to cause a heart attack or a stroke, all of that research was paid for. I'm going to let you guys tell me. I'm not going to say it. Who paid for that research? The cholesterol drug manufacturers, yes. They designed the studies. They ran the studies. If the study didn't show what they wanted it to show, they put it in the file drawer. All of the researchers either owned stock in the company or they were actual employees of the company. So do you think that there's any bias in those studies? Do you think they cut any corners? Do you think they maybe hid some data? Of course they did. Just like the Vioxx people hid all kinds of data showing it blatantly that it was dangerous. They hid that because they were making billions of dollars. So in my opinion, having normal LDL cholesterol and total cholesterol, having high LDL or total is not dangerous. It's not a marker for metabolic health. It's nothing to be concerned about. It's just part of the normal distribution curve that is human physiology. Some people go up, some don't. Your body's not going to let those things go haywire unless you need them. Okay. Now, mm -hmm. if you want to know what are markers of good metabolic health, it is your hemoglobin A1C. It is your either your fasting insulin or your C-peptide level. It is your triglyceride level. Mm -hmm. It is your HDL cholesterol level. And it is your markers of inflammation. Those are the markers. When you get all of those normal, you are metabolically healthy. I don't give a damn what your total cholesterol is or what your LDL cholesterol is. Uh, Ashley, you may remember a year or two ago when all the plant-based people were talking about TMAO. If it's if yeah. TMAO, oh my God, it's, it's the new marker. It's going to, well, guess what? Nobody talks about TMAO anymore. And I predict that markers like LDL cholesterol, ApoB, LP little a, all these markers that right now are like, oh my God, your ApoB is high from eating all the saturated fats. You're going to be dead in six months. Two, three, four years from now, nobody's going to be talking about LP little a and, and, and ApoB. It's just, they're not going to, because it's going to fall by the wayside, just like TMAO and all those other markers that the plant based community was saying, that's it, your TMAO is how you're going to die. Mm -hmm. Nobody says that anymore because it, when you, we actually did some research on it, we found out it was foolish. 
And so I predict that's what's going to happen to these markers as well. But the markers that have stood the test of time are your, your fasting blood sugar, your A1C, your fasting insulin, your C-peptide, your triglycerides, and your HDL cholesterol, and your markers of inflammation. Those have stood the test of time. They've been around for decades, and we've got reams of research showing that they are very important for overall metabolic health. And I'll, I'll leave you with this, Ashley. There was a study that looked at the hazard ratio, like what are the things that if you have them, the, you are most at risk of having a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And the average doctor, if you said, what's the most dangerous thing a patient can have? They would say high LDL cholesterol. Evidently, because that's all they want to talk about, right? <laughs> yeah. When you actually look at the research and crunch the numbers, the most dangerous thing you can have is type 2 diabetes. And the more uncontrolled it is, the more at risk you are for having a heart attack or a stroke. The next thing is metabolic syndrome. The next thing is hypertension. The next thing is prediabetes, right? The and then smoking. And then, so then the question becomes well, where does high LDL cholesterol fall in that hierarchy? Mm -hmm. It's number 14 on the list. It doesn't even make the top 10. So is it a small risk? Maybe. Yeah. But remember, all the research was done on, on red eaters and rice eaters and bean eaters. They also had hyperinsulinemia. Mm -hmm. So what about in the case of somebody who's got a very low insulin level, very low levels of inflammation, if their LDL is high, is that even a marker for heart disease? Mm -hmm. I say no. That's my hypothesis. We'll see how that turns out. But just ranking things, if if your viewers, your followers, if they want to decrease their risk of heart attack and stroke, they need to completely reverse their, their type 2 diabetes back to normal A1C of 5.6 or lower. That okay. is the biggest risk factor for heart attack and stroke. Far and away. The next is metabolic syndrome. So you're going to eat a diet that's going to lower your A1C, that's going to lower your waist to height ratio, that's going to lower your triglycerides. That's going to lower your blood pressure. Guess what diet that is? A ketogenic, ketovore, carnivore diet. There's actually a new study out. You know, the American Heart Association talks about the DASH diet. Lowers yep. lowers blood pressure more than anything else. They actually did a head-to-head -head study. Keto versus DASH. Mm -hmm. Guess which one lowered blood pressure the most? It wasn't even close. Yeah. Keto kicked the DASH diet's ass i've got a youtube video about it right oh yeah if you truly want to lower your risk of having a heart attack or a stroke you're going to lower the top 10 things you're going to focus on that if you're if you're smoking currently stop being an idiot an idiot stop smoking okay mm -hmm. if you have type 2 diabetes eat a diet that reverses that if you've got metabolic syndrome if you've got high blood pressure eat a diet that reverses that Without exception, that's going to be a proper human diet, which is either ketogenic, ketovore, or carnivore. Those are the diets that reverse that. Now, can you lower your A1C with a vegan diet? Yes, you can lower your A1C. You can help control your A1C. But there's no research on the planet Earth that shows that you can reverse type 2 diabetes back to a normal A1C with a vegan diet or even a plant-based diet. How does the vegan diet even lower your A1C? Is it just because it's calorie restrictive? It's calorie restrictive. That might matter a little, but the main thing is, is when you adopt a whole foods plant-based diet, mm -hmm. you're eating fibrous vegetables. That's why you have to eat for 16 solid hours a day to give them <laughs> nutrition, right? But, what, but invariably, they tell you to stop the processed food. And so we know that when it comes to glycemic index and glycemic loads, the more you process plants, right, wheat, rice, oats, corn, soybean, when you grind them up and make a flour or make a meal, that's that spikes your blood sugar much faster and keeps it spiked for much longer. Mm -hmm. Glycemic index and glycemic load. Yeah. And so you're going to, if you're eating whole food plant based, you're going to eliminate all the highly processed carbs. That's going to allow, if you, if you, so if you were living on Pepsi Cola, and Doritos and, and Lucky Charms, and you stop eating that shit, and that's what it is, pure mm -hmm. shit, yep. and you start eating whole food plant-based, yeah, your A1C is going to come down from 14. It's probably going to come down to eight or nine. Huge improvement, right? And so when you see the 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 vegan influencers talking about, oh, it, it lowers A1C, yes, it does, but does it lower it back to normal? 
Mm-hmm. And the answer, when you look at the research, is uh, no. It, it sometimes can get it down to about seven. That's it. That's as slow as you can go with a vegan diet. But if you want to have an A1C of 5.6 or lower, you've got to eat keto, ketovore, carnivore. There is no other option. So the vegan diet is less bad than the standard American. I love that. That's exactly the way to say it and to think about it. It's less bad. Just like when the cigarette manufacturers came out with filtered cigarettes. Mm-hmm. There were doctors promoting them as good. Oh, my God, these are so good for you. No, 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 no. A filtered cigarette is not good. Mm-hmm. It's just less bad. And that's uh, a vegan, whole food, plant-based diet is less bad than the standard Western diet. Yes, it is. Yeah. But that doesn't make it good. Dr. Barry, I have so many more questions for you. I'm going to have to ask for you to come back on another time. Sure. I, I, but Absolutely. for now, where can people follow you and where can they learn more about all of your work that you're doing? It is so important. So I've got a little YouTube channel. that you little. To follow. <laughs> Uh, I've got over 900 videos about literally every medical and nutrition topic and many medicines. And so if you go to YouTube and you type in the search bar, Dr. Barry, fatty liver, Dr. Barry, high blood pressure, Dr. Barry, uh, Wagovi, Dr. Barry, plant-based, any, anything, you're probably going to find one or two or three videos that I've made about that subject. And very often in the show notes of my videos, I actually link straight to the research that I use to make the video. So if you're like, how can how can keto make acne better? The research is in the show notes. How can how can keto make PCOS better? The research is in the show notes. I'm not making this stuff up. I'm basing it on all the research that's out there that nobody wants to talk about because right now a plant based diet is very popular. Yeah. If I'm feeling especially snarky, you'll find me on Twitter. If I'm feeling loving and helpful, you'll find me on Instagram. Uh, my wife and I also have a private group with thousands of people in it who are just, they, they're dedicated. And as long as they follow a proper human diet, all their medical problems are in remission or they're gone. Yeah. And so some people need a group, a tribe, right? They need some, they need some support. And so we offer that as well. If people want that, we've got thousands of people in there now from all over the world who want to be part of that tribe so that they can say, hey, I need, I'm, I'm having this craving. I need some support. I, or I did this thing. Is this good or bad? And so they've got this immediate sounding board of, of pe- like-minded people who are like, yeah, dude, I did that too. It's no big deal. All you got to do is this, this, and this. And so you've got that hand-holding support. We, we offer that. Uh, I've got lies my doctor told me. I've got kicking ass after 50. If you're over 50 and you think the recliner is the best-looking thing in the house, you got to talk. You need to read my book or listen to it on Audible. Also, Common Sense Labs, it talks about all the lab tests Great. that many doctors just don't know about. Mm-hmm. They either didn't learn it or they forgot it, and they don't know how to truly test for metabolic health, yeah. your thyroid health, for adrenal health, and other things. That book will help you understand. Uh, two of my books are on Audible, so if you have ADHD like I do, you can just listen to them while you do something else. Mm-hmm. Common Sense Labs is available as a paperback or as an ebook, a Kindle, because it'd be hard to do that as an author. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. So that's where I'm at. Thank you, Ashley, so much for this opportunity. I love the work you're doing. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah, that was amazing. So if you guys are watching us on YouTube, please subscribe and leave a comment below. Let me know what you think about this. If you have any questions for us, I read all of them and respond. I could reach out to Dr. Barry and ask his opinion for some. (laughs) Um, If you're listening to this on a podcast platform, please follow and leave a review. Um, And just thank you again, Dr. Barry, for being here. And I hope that we can meet again. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. See you all next time.